Someone asked me if I would be able to program their smart TV based on the title of this tonight. No, you're not going to get any instructions on how to program your TVs here, so it's not going to happen. That's a HAL question. <laughs> Outsmarting your smart TV. I want to begin by reading a passage of scripture in Matthew chapter 6, verses 22 and 23. The Lord says the following. The eye is the lamp of the body. So then, if your eye is clear, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light that is in you is darkness, how great is the darkness indeed. In this passage, uh, Jesus teaches us a basic truth about human nature and uh, gives a warning. First of all, the truth is that what we allow into our hearts through our eyes will determine what kind of hearts we have. And secondly, the warning is that we should guard our eyes because through them we can either be in the light or in the darkness. In other words, our vision, what we look at, what we see, what we permit to enter, influences our character. It's no wonder then that there is such a battle going on these days for the control of the airwaves that carry the images, the video images, uh, whether they're you know, movies or television or computer screens or tablet or phone or TV or smart TV, whatever. By the way, smart TV, uh, the perfect storm of, of uh, information. You know, you've got your computer, so you go on the computer and you look at stuff on your computer and you browse and you surf the net and you go to internet sites, that's a computer. Then, you know, we're talking back in the old days. And then, you, know, you, want to, you, you want to watch TV, CBS, or you want to watch sports, you, know, you go to your, you know, your big screen, your flat screen, your 80 inch screen, your curved screen, whatever screen you've got, and you're, you're watching your TV. Well, now with the smart TV, they've taken the computer and they've taken the television, they've merged them together. Now you can watch your shows, CBS, NBC, Fox, whatever, you can watch your shows on TV, but at the same time, whatever you could watch on your tablet, on your computer, on your phone, you can now watch them on your 80 inch TV screen, all controlled with that little remote. So that's, that's what the smart TV is. They've just converged. All this information now will be accessible to you through your television. So like I said, there's a great battle going on in, on the airwaves. Who controls? Who controls what you see? So the people who control what you see in a large measure control you and control me. So my lesson tonight, I, I want to share some ideas originally brought forth by a friend, and a, a colleague in the ministry, no longer doing that, but working now at Oklahoma Christian, Kent Allen. Uh, some ideas that he had a while back that I want to share with you that may help us outsmart our smart TVs and not allow them to control us and more importantly, as Jesus said, not allow them to darken our hearts with the things that they want to show us on our smart TV. So how does TV, and I say TV you know, as the catchphrase for everything, whatever is on a screen, tablet, phone, whatever is on a screen, just for the sake of this lesson here, we'll call it TV, okay? Because I don't want to repeat over and over again, tablet, screen, phone, whatever, okay? In his book, The Electronic Millstone, an older book, but a very, you know, very good book, Dr. Philip Patterson says that the greatest single danger that video in all of its forms poses towards us is the idea that video has no influence on us. That's the dangerous idea, that what we watch actually doesn't affect us in any way. People think that what they see on their computers or TVs or movies or whatever doesn't really have any effect on them. And this belief is the greatest danger of all, more dangerous than the actual images, itself, uh, uh, images themselves. When people watch media with this in mind, they're the most vulnerable to media's influence. 
Now in his research, and of course I say it's an older book because at the time he was talking about television and he was talking about movies and things like that, you know, less about computers, but we know it's all the same thing, same effect. They're visuals, just different platforms presenting those visuals to us. So in his research, Dr. Patterson found out that TV does influence us in a variety of ways. For example, TV shapes our values. In other words, what we think is important, what we think is good or bad or cool, or to be accepted or rejected is largely determined by what we watch in our day and in our age. Now there was a time when the home and the school and the church and newspapers you know, this is, this is what formed our opinions, this is what formed our ideas, but now TV, computers, the internet, you know, now these are the things that form our ideas. And of course, television in all of its forms has a great impact on how we shape our values. Secondly, TV causes unrealistic expectations. You know, TV blurs the concept or the perception of reality. You know, after watching some 10,000 commercials, you begin to expect people to look a certain way or to own certain things. You know, the people at the real beach don't look anything like the people at the beach on Baywatch. You ever notice? The guys at high school uh, they don't look, they don't act, they don't talk like the groups on like The Bachelor. You ever notice that? And yet there are a million people trying hard and being disappointed that they're not. Interesting to note that when you look at the bios of the actors that play roles, you know, uh, like for high school, like a program that has high school, you find out that they're actors in their 20s, <laughs> not 16 year olds and 17 year olds. Number three, TV numbs our sensitivity to suffering. Overexposure to violence may not make us violent people, but it does make us more indifferent to the suffering of other people. You know, if in a period of three years you see roughly 10,000 killings, you're thinking, wow, that's a lot, really? Over a period of three years, young, younger people watching a lot of TV and movies, playing video games and so on and so forth, 10,000 people get killed, blown up, tortured, whatever. Well, after you've seen this in movies on TVs, how can you be shocked when just one person is reported murdered on the news? Yeah, one guy, what's the big deal? The evidence of this is that the reality shows are now more popular today because people are no longer thrilled by the movie about murder. They want to see a documentary about a real murder. They want to get to as close to reality as they can. Why? Because for years we've been numbed, you know, we've been put asleep to the notion of violence and, and suffering. How else do you explain the 13-year-old or a 14-year-old you know, killing another 14-year-old or 15-year-old with a gun just because that person had the wrong color shirt on or that person insulted him or you know, dissed him somehow? That 14-year-old had to be totally numbed out as far as what real suffering is all about. And numbness to suffering is dangerous because if you can't care about suffering, then you have trouble loving and have less trouble allowing other people to suffer. I mean, this was the condition of the world in the day of Noah when the Bible says that the earth was filled with violence. What do you think it meant? Well, it meant exactly what it said. The earth was filled with violence. The intention of the heart was continually to evil. They were numb to what was good and and what was right. And you know what? It's exactly the same in our day and age. Nothing new under the sun, as Solomon said. Number four, television or TV media reduces resistance to sin. You know, it does this by glamorizing sin or by showing it as normal, even something good. Homosexuality, for example, has always been seen as immoral behavior, as the Bible says that it is. 
But see how television and you know, media has normalized this type of activity by presenting sympathetic homosexual characters in movies and in TV dramas and comedies. You know, people identify with these people, they like these people, they accept them, you know, the, the make-believe people that they see, and in doing so they also accept the sinfulness as normal. It's just normal, isn't it? You know, anytime you want to make what is wrong and sinful and against God's will into something right and good and desirable, all you have to do is glamorize it, make it normal, for example, get movie stars to use drugs or have famous people say that abortion is okay, is normal, you know, woman's right to choose and make sure that you get a very attractive person to say that because beautiful people don't lie, do they? <laughs> and show pictures of happy people smoking and ingesting alcohol, all of it being normal. You know, the, they don't do that anymore, but I remember, and I think some of the older people remember when they had commercials for beer, right? On, and people were having a great time and drinking, and all these beautiful girls you know, were drinking beer and so on and so forth. That is not the reality that I used to see before I became a Christian in bars and places that I used to go to. That is not the reality. You don't get people to actually try these things for themselves right away because of TV or the internet, but you do get them to begin thinking that, well, they must be okay. You even get them thinking that it's wrong to be against these things. Notice, <laughs> several states have passed laws, defense of religion laws, you know, and really at the base of this was to do what? Well, to push back against the LGBT community or group or lobbyists who want to permit a man who thinks he's a woman uh, and who acts out as a woman to give that person the right to go into a woman's bathroom. Okay. And when the governor and the legislators and the people rose up and say, no, we're not going to do that. And if the federal government's not going to protect our rights, we're going to protect our rights as states. And so they pass a law and say, no, you can't, you can't do that. You know, if you're biologically a man, you go into the men's bathroom. If you're biologically a woman, you go into the woman's bathroom. I don't want a man who thinks he's a woman going into the bathroom while my granddaughter is there. And I don't think you would want that either. But did you see the outcry? <laughs> the NFL threatened not to put the Super Bowl in that state and Coca-Cola and Disney. Well, of course, Disney, I mean, you know, Disney is one of the, the biggest purveyors and encouragers of gay rights that we have in corporate America. They all pushed back. For what? To allow men who think they are women to go into women's bathrooms? Imagine. How did we get there? Well, we normalized it. We've had 20 years of showing healthy, happy, wonderful, sympathetic characters who happen to be gay. Well, of course, this present generation is thinking, well, what could be wrong with that? Why would the Bible say that that would be wrong? And so TV resists, uh, reduces my, my own personal resistance to sin and also my concept of what sin is. Number five, TV replaces my relationships. You know, I tell young people who are about to get married, you, know, you want to give them good advice, so on and so forth. I tell them, do not put a television in your bedroom. Do not put a computer into your bedroom. It'll kill your sex life. Don't, don't do that. You know, we think being a, a, a football widow or a soap opera fan is funny, but many people would rather be with their tablets or their TVs or their phones than with their families and friends and spouses. TV does this in a subtle way in that it gives you everything you want and it asks for nothing in return. You ever notice that about television? Ah, oh, I'm going to relax. 
Got myself a little snack, got myself a little beverage, got the remote, I'm going to sit down. Why is it so good? Because the TV doesn't ask you to get up and do something. The television doesn't say to you, would you mind taking out the trash? The TV doesn't say to you, mommy, play with me. Daddy, come, let's go play ball outside. The TV makes zero demands on you. It has a hypnotic effect on you. Try getting somebody's attention while they're glued to it. It makes people passive. You know, women watch Oprah jog. They watch Oprah talk. They watch Oprah read or cook. But a lot of them don't do it. They just watch Oprah, uh, Oprah do it. Men watch the home run and the action heroes. They watch the, you know, the, 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 the pretend soldiers get the bad guys, but they don't do any of it, they just watch it. We've become a watching society instead of a doing society. Number six, TV wastes a lot of your time and my time. You know, if you watch about three hours of TV a day, you're spending 20% of your waking hours in front of a screen of some kind. Think about that. A fifth of your disposable time in front of a screen. A fifth of your life. You know, a latest study that I read in the paper shows that children spend less time outdoors than convicts. <laughs> People in jail spend more time outdoors, because they want to get outdoors, <laughs> than kids. Why? Well, kids are they're in front of their screens. Less time with your spouse or children, less time with your Lord, less time that you spend improving your life, less time serving. People shouldn't ask, why they feel guilty or helpless or poor self-esteem or they lack motivation or the sense that they're not getting anywhere. They're wasting 20% of their lives looking at fantasies about other people's lives, following some clueless reality show star on Twitter. Really? Do we really care what some reality star thinks about how nice the, the sunrise is this morning? I mean, I could go on to say some positive things about information, entertainment, educational values of internet and TV. Come on, Hal and I, we do Bible talk. We, I think the internet is a great tool. But this lesson is not about that. It's about the negative ways that TV or media influences us and how we can control this. Now, I don't advocate that we throw away, there was a movement, I remember back in the day, Get rid of your TV, you know, throw the TV out. I don't, I don't say that. TV all by itself, you know, it's neutral. It can be used for good or bad. It's not the problem. The only time I say we should eliminate something totally is when that thing is inherently bad. You know, like lying. You can't lie in moderation. You know what I'm saying? You can't, you know, people say everything in moderation. You can't commit adultery in moderation. You know what I'm saying? You can't do that. But TV, that's something that can be done in moderation. You can't do cocaine in moderation or LSD in moderation. See, some things are inherently evil, inherently destructive. There is no moderation. There is no one time or just this time. TV, however, is one of those things in life that can be a blessing or a curse. The secret is how to use it, and in this day and age, how to outsmart it, because the ones who design the programs and the games and all the stuff, they're pretty smart people. So I want to finish off this evening with the smart way to watch your smart TV and all other screens. The smart way to watch your smart TV. Number one, select what you're going to watch. The beautiful thing about today is we have some control. I was watching the Masters, you know, the golf tournament. I like to play golf. The Masters are the best golfers in the world, blah, blah, blah. There's just something about the Masters that's fun. And whoop, time to go to church. Hey, isn't the DVR a wonderful invention? 
just go to the button, click, select, record, go for an extra hour just in case there's a tie and blah, blah, blah. All right, let's get ready, let's go to church. So select what you're going to watch. You know, once it's, it's on it, it stays on, and with the remote you can flip around until you find the lowest common denominator, which is usually the lowest quality. The worst thing in the world is to sit there with the remote and just go through channel after channel after channel to find something, because usually the thing you find when you're doing that is not a good thing. Christians seek things which, as Paul says, are right and pure and lovely and praiseworthy. Philippians 4 verse 8. Solomon says, a wise man is hungry for truth while the mocker feeds on trash. Proverbs 15, 14. David said, turn my eyes away from worthless things. Psalm 119 verse 37. It's a question of who is in control. Are you in control or is the controller in control? Who's controlling who here? So select what you're going to watch and thankfully we have, the, we have the equipment nowadays that allows us to select exactly what we're going to watch. There's times when I, I'll spend an hour just going through the menu, looking at what the new shows are, researching, oh that looks interesting, okay, select, you know, record that when that comes on and so on and so forth. It's marvelous. We have no excuse today. Oh, I didn't know it was on. Sure you knew. Number two, manage. Manage your TV. As I said, with the arrival of the DVR, you have no excuse to miss the kids' ball game or to skip church for the big game on TV or use up family time to see your favorite show. Don't have to do that anymore. Don't even have to choose between those things anymore. The Apostle Paul says, make the most of every opportunity. Ephesians 5 verse 16. And Solomon again says, there is an appointed time for everything. And you know what? There's a time for TV. There's a time for TV. But I don't think the time for TV is the time when worship is happening. Because when worship is on, the time for worship is the time for worship, not for TV. Technology affords us the opportunity to keep our priorities straight, especially when it comes to screen time. Number three, actively evaluate what you see. Solomon says, a simple man believes everything, Proverbs 14, 15. Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 5, Test everything, hold on to the good, and avoid every kind of evil. Experts tell us that this is the best way to be online or to watch TV with children. You can't hide them from every bad word or every bad idea that comes in, but you can teach them to know the difference between what is good and what is bad, what is useless, what is gossip, what is propaganda. I remember when the kids used to live at home and we'd watch TV and I think they'd get a little tired of it. You know? But I would, I'd be watching and I'd say, okay, you see what that guy just said right there? That's just propaganda. That's not news. <laughs> That's propaganda right there, you know, and, or I'd make a comment about something. I was always talking to the television. They didn't like it much, but <laughs> I see them doing it now. <laughs> the objective, of course, is to know how to filter out the bad and learn to be blessed by what is good. There's lots of good stuff out there, but there's also a lot of bad stuff. Number four, regulate, regulate how many hours of TV or screen time that you permit yourself. You don't eat four plates of spaghetti, do you? You kind of regulate, I know you'd like to, but I'm just saying, you, know, you, you have a, a plate and then you say, well, just, just a little, a third of a portion, I just, you know, just a little bit more. But mama makes enough to, to, to feed seven people and you're only two. You're not going to wipe out the whole thing, are you? You regulate yourself. You control some of yourself. Well, the same thing has to happen with screen time nowadays. Log how much screen time you put in and see how much of your waking life is invested in an activity which does very little for you many times and can also do a lot against you. 
Again, the Apostle Paul says, everything is permissible for me, but not everything is beneficial or constructive. 1 Corinthians 6, verse 12. It's okay to watch TV, but if your TV watching is not allowing you to be a good student, I remember when I worked at Oklahoma Christian, and <laughs> these freshmen would come in, whoa, finally, freedom! I'm free, you know, well, away from home for the first time. I got my dorm room, man, they were up there till 3 a.m. In those days, you know, playing video games, you know, Mario Brothers, wow, nobody's telling me to go to bed. I, there's nobody bugging me, you know. And then the five-week grades would come in. And in those days, parents got the five-week grades. And so they're paying 20,000 bucks to send kiddo to OC and all of a sudden kiddo sends home a report card with an F, a C, an incomplete and two B's. And you see mama and daddy come visit the school, come visit the dean, come and visit their son and go home with the Nintendo under their arm. We need to be careful that our screen time is not, you know, interfering with us being good students or good homemakers or being a good husband or parent or a good Christian. If that's the case, you need to make a change. TV and screen time, as I said, it's not a bad thing, but your consumption of it may be bad for you. Number five, turn. In the old days, we'd just say, turn the channel when offended. Today we say, delete the trash, set filters. Some people think, oh, I ought to set filters because I have young children. Yes, but you know what? You need to set filters just for you because the people out there doling out the trash, they're looking for you. They're trying to get you. Pornography is as powerful as cocaine. People don't, read, don't realize that. You know, we had that course here, that little seminar we did for several weeks. And one of the things that kept coming back in, the, in that person's lesson was that pornography was like cocaine. You see it one time and it stimulates a part of your brain, the very same part of your brain that cocaine stimulates, pornography stimulates. And those who promote it to sell it know this. They just want to give you a taste. Just try it. How, how could it harm you? And they don't begin with you know, hardcore pornography. They begin with softcore. They begin with what we call titillation. You know, just a little curiosity thing. You're reading the newspaper and over on the side there's this little box here that says, you know, the most beautiful women uh, the 20 top looking models for you know, 2016. Well, it looks harmless enough. And you say, wow, the 20 top models, really? What could be so bad? You know, and you click on that and what you get is, well, you get 20 top models in various stages of undress. And then pretty soon you're, you're looking for the 2017 version of that thing. And you know how it works. Pretty soon you, you want something more, you want something a little more exciting and so on and so forth. It'll just draw you in a little at a time. You have the remote, but do you have the ability and the sensitive conscience enough to switch? To say no? When they say that after the commercial they're going to be showing uh, the beach where all the naked models are, are shown, are you, are you Smart enough, strong enough to say, well, I believe I'm going to you know, switch that. When they announce that they're going to be replaying the violent death at 10 p.m., do you tune in? Do you go to sites that have questionable material? When the movie has blasphemed God and used the Lord's name over and over again, has glorified evil and tried to gross you out or stimulate you, Do you have the courage to just turn it off? When is enough enough? I used to say to our children to help them you know, you know, develop some sort of uh, mm, decision making ability. Sometimes the pearl is not worth the mud. 
or the other way around. Sometimes the, you know, the amount of mud that you have to traipse through to get to the pearl, the pearl was the story. And the excuse was, yeah, it's a great movie, it's got a great story and a good message. Yes, that could be true, but by the time you get to that good message, maybe you've had a tramp through nudity and swearing and cursing and all kinds of junk. That's what I meant. Maybe sometimes all the mud you have to go through to get to the pearl, just not worth it. Brothers and sisters, younger brothers and sisters, there's a reason that there are ratings. <laughs> There's a reason that it's got an R rating. There's a reason that it's got an MA mature. There's a reason for that. You can be absolutely positive as a Christian that if a movie has an MA rating, you're going to be offended. You're going to be exposed to stuff that you know, a Christian should not deliberately consume. In other words, is there a limit to the darkness that you are going to let in? Or is there so much darkness in you that you can't even see it anymore? When offended, turn it off. We've walked out of a movie and asked for our money back. You know, not, you know, sometimes they say PG-13, you figure, okay, you know, maybe the, somebody gets shot or it's a war movie or something, but then you know, they surprise us, there was stuff in there, we just... When in the first three minutes they use the name of Jesus at least six times, you know which road you're going down. And we've walked out of there and went to the manager and very politely said, you know, we just weren't ready for what, what we didn't think the movie was like that. And I remember this particular fellow, oh, hey, great, you know, here's, a, here's a ticket, a rain check, you know, select a movie that is suitable for you or, you know, and uh, you know, come on back, you didn't want to lose a customer. If you're never offended, turn it off and get on your knees and ask for some light in your life. I can relate to this lesson myself because as an, as an only child with both of my parents working and gone, I mean, I'd get up, my parents were gone to work and make my breakfast and go to school and then come home and with a key and I let myself in. And I don't mean I was like 16, I was nine. And I just wait at home till they got home. So I grew up watching television, spending long Saturdays in front, of the, in front of the TV. My minor, when I was in college, was radio television. And I've produced TV programs and I've made videos all my adult life. The struggle to outsmart the TV began long ago and it goes on today. But it can be a winning effort if we're smart about it. If we're smart about choosing what we see, you be in control. Remember, everything that comes in, you chose it. You chose it. If we're smart about managing and evaluating what we see and eliminating what is ungodly, if we're smart about limiting our time and activity and actively, by the way, uh, denying ourselves to participate by watching things that go against our conscience and against God's word. Believe me, with so much screen, so much media you know, attacking us day after day after day, it's a constant struggle. But the peace and the joy that result, they're worth the effort. I mean, what is your peace of mind worth to you? I believe that we should all go before the Lord with the words of David when he said the following, I will set before my eyes no vile thing. Psalm 101, three. Dads, well what do you say to your children if they happen to walk in and, and see you watching something which is absolutely unacceptable? What do you say to them? Where is your moral authority after that? Moms, how can you tell your children, do this, do that, get serious, you know, kind of focus on their work and their homework and be good students, 
if you yourself are, you know, spend hours on the phone just chit-chatting and twittering away on the various, you know, how, how, how can you get them not to do that? It's not easy because the TV and the computer and the tablet and the phone, they're always there and they're always drawing us into them. But we can be smart and we can use it to our edification with prayer and with self-discipline. So if this is something that you, you know, you're having a, a problem with, and of course you need the prayers of the church or you want to confess your faith in Christ, be baptized, of course, you know, we're using the internet for that. But this sermon tonight wasn't about preaching the gospel. The sermon tonight was about exhorting the church to have light within itself. Brothers and sisters, how can we be the light of the world if we're filled with darkness? How can we shed the light of Christ to the unsaved if we're con con continually absorbing and consuming darkness? We can't do it. So if you need the ministry of the church, you need to talk with the elders, you know, if this is something that's in your backyard, something that you need to talk and pray about, any of the ministry, any of the elders are there to share and talk and visit and pray with you, whatever your need is. We offer the invitation as we do this evening. Please think about the things that have been said and think about your response now as we stand and as we sing our song of encouragement.